it's a great honor to speak in this wonderful house. It is a great privilege. Uh, it's also a great privilege to work, to visit here so often, and to work with my dear colleagues uh, on the Brogel project. Um, Elke Obertaler, Sabine Pinot, Manfred Selling, and Alice Hopper and Ancourt, uh, which with, together we will organize this uh, very fantastic Bruegel exhibition, which will open in October 2018, which will make us all forget the Bosch exhibition very quickly. All right, uh, beyond the devilish details, looking deeper into Bosch. Um, when we think of Bosch, most of you will think of images like this, nightmarish uh, scenes, uh, devils that are attacking human beings, monsters that are literally cutting throats of human beings. <coughs> what we will do today is what I want to do is bring you on a journey to some of the uh, works that, uh, that we and other people have looked at and we will zoom in to look very close at some paintings and we zoom out again and we'll take the broader view. Um, but let's start with zooming out a little bit of this detail because we need, when we try to make sense of these images, these devilish details, we, in this case, we do need to zoom out. And we, we find that these images are related, yeah, that these two details are on the same painting and here you see the entire painting, the, uh, the river to hell, which is in uh, Venice, in the Palazzo Grimani. But it's not just a scene of hell. Uh, how many of you have actually seen this painting in the Palazzo Grimani? I see one hand, two hands, few hands. So the people who, who has, have seen this and who have seen this in the uh, exhibition in Certo Gombos uh, or in Madrid, will know that it's actually part of a larger ensemble. It's not just a river to hell, it is actually a, it's part of the visions of the hereafter. So we have a fall of the damned, a river to hell, the garden of Eden, and the ascent of the blessed. So we, we, we cannot really look at one of these details, these definitely details, without taking these, in this case, this entire ensemble in consideration. But at the same time, we need to, um, we need to establish or, or to uh, admit that we know hardly anything about these works. The, uh, we don't know the sequence of them, how they were hung. We don't know their original function. We do not know for whom they were painted. For instance, uh, the sequence that I just showed you uh, was actually the sequence they were shown in the exhibition in Sertogenbosch, in the very last room. But in our monograph, they are depicted like this. And it's just as good or just as bad because we simply do not know how they were, um, how they were hung originally, how they were uh, functioning. We do know that they were most likely the wings of something. But they could have been the double wings of a triptych and, that f and the wings that folded over a central panel that was twice the total width of the wings. But they might as well have been the wings of something that functioned in a vertical fashion. How do we know that they uh, functioned as wings? The original frames have disappeared, so any hardware such as original hinges has disappeared through time or over time, but uh, since the uh, spectacular restoration uh, in Venice quite recently, uh, we now have um, the reverses of these works have uh, refound their original glory. And here you can see some traces of original red marbling, but so we have two uh, panels with a red uh, stone imitation reverse and two panels with a green stone imitation reverse. Um, and let's zoom in uh, on these green, uh, on the green panel. And before 2015, before the recent cleaning, it looked like this. So you can see the, uh, the restoration truly had a spectacular result. And I would like to congratulate Grillo Bono and Maria Chiara Maida for the incredible uh, work they've done on this restoration. 
but when we zoom in, yeah, first we zoomed out, we'll take a, s a step back in at these uh, red stone imitation, we actually see, w we can marvel at the splattering and the dripping and apparently the panel was even uh, hold sideways so, so the paint could drip in a certain direction. We were joking that this, this is not Jackson Pollock, but we jokingly called this Bollock. Um, but when we look very closely, and especially in this circle, for example, you can see small areas of black shimmering through. And they're actually all over the, uh, uh, the panel. And you can also see that black coming through in the cracks on the, uh, on the front. For instance, this is the ascent into heaven. And you can see all throughout, here we are in this location, and all throughout, you can see this black paint shimmering through in the cracks of the paint surface. That's actually really curious. And I think this is important if we want to establish or say more about these paintings. And the most curious thing is those, this black paint actually points to a lower layer of black coating, a opaque black paint layer, which is painted all over these four panels, both the front and the back. And that um, you, can, you can see very clearly uh, on the hand by, by, oh, sorry, by the infrared reflectogram. I'm giving away my clues. Uh, because the black paint underneath the paint surface also absorbs the infrared. And this might seem as if you penetrate the paint, but it's not the case. This is actually, this paint is too thick, a too thick layer of lead white to be penetrated in infrared. So within Netherlandish painting, if we zoom in, you see that uh, very clearly that the black paint is really truly everywhere. In the infrared, by the way, you see a nice detail here of the shadow of an angel. I hope you can see that figure with wings that is welcoming the soul that is entering heaven. Uh, I hope that will await you all at some point. Um, there's so much we don't know about these panels because this work method is, is truly uh, unprecedented. There are maybe a handful of panels, uh, Netherlandish panels, that were prepared on a black uh, coating, but those were invariably works that were uh, sent away uh, without the wings being finished at the time. So they were coated black, probably to be protected and to be finished locally uh, by the painters. So this is truly um, remarkable and it might indicate, a, um, although nobody uh, is doubting the um, attribution of these works to, uh, to Bosch, perhaps with the exception of Fritz Korny, who is with us tonight. Um, so what do we know about Bosch? There's, there's an enormous amount we don't know. He was not even called Hieronymus Bosch. His name was Jun van Aken. And um, we do know that he lived and died in Sertogenbos. He passed away in 1516. We assume he was born around 1450, but that is not certain. We do know for certain that he was born in a family of painters. It was a true uh, painting clan. His grandfather, father, uncles, uh, cousins, they all painted. What is curious about Bosch, for Bosch is that he had a extremely high social status for the time. He was a sworn brother of the confraternity of Our Lady, which was it was a very large confraternity, had over 10,000 members, and to be a sworn member of that, uh, to be one of the elite core um, members was a real, was exceptional. He married well, which is always a good idea when you're an artist. <laughs> uh, they were rel she was relatively wealthy um, and had no children. He changed his surname from Van Aken to Bosch in the 1490s, uh, most probably to aid his international patrons to find him, because of course Aachen, Aachen is, is Flemish for Aachen. If you would sign that you're from Aachen, 
they would go f uh, f find you in the wrong city. So it's not a bad idea to change your uh, surname in a, a toponym Bosch, which is of course uh, short for Sertogenbos or Denbos. Bosch received commissions uh, from the highest circles in the Burgundian court, and we can't uh, emphasize that enough. He was not uh, or very rarely painting for the open art market. No, he painted mostly on commissions. But, and this is really a problem uh, for art historians, not a single documented work survives. Not one. Eh? Even the most famous iconic words, like the Garden of Earthly Delights, we do not have a commission. We do not know who it was painted for. So basically, what the problem is that we, we have a big oeuvre, but we, do not, we don't have a core oeuvre. Right? We cannot expand from the, uh, from the core outwards. We also don't have a single dated work. So it's very difficult to create an early oeuvre and to create a late oeuvre because we don't have an anchor or anchors where we can hang that on. It's a pyramid upside down. And of course, over the years, um, over the last 120 years or so, iconography has truly dominated the scholarship on Bosch. Um, so, to recapitulate, what's the problem? The problem is big. So we have a group of paintings yeah, which are thematically and iconographically very tightly linked. And that is already the case in the 16th century, which is extremely early. There's very few oeuvres that were already recognized as such in the 16th century. Most of these oeuvres were put together much later. And as I mentioned, not a single work, uh, eh, not a single panel can be securely attributed to Bosch uh, with a, a documented commission and we don't have a sec secured chronology. And to make matters worse, from a technical point of view, these, this group is incredibly um, uneven. They, the techniques that we find are very diverse, although we can make clusters, smaller subgroups, that are more clearly related, um, but the, uh, the oeuvre is un, um, unusually diverse. And then technical examinations can help, uh, can often help art historians in oeuvres like this, although, as which is quite often the case with science, we often end up with more questions than answers. All right, what do we do? We, a Netherlandish panel painting, and this is important, is not a two-dimensional object, as you know, but it truly is a, a three-dimensional, multi-layered, very complex object. And for my students, I always try to make the analogy with a lasagna. It, uh, although there are, no, there are no repeating layers uh, of sauce or cheese, but it has several different layers. We have a panel support, uh, which in the Netherlands, for Netherlandish panel paintings, was almost invariably oak from the Baltic region. We have an underdrawing, uh, which is depicted or drawn on a whitish ground, a mixture of chalk and glue. Uh, on that, uh, in the traditional uh, work method, on that underdrawing would be an underpainting, uh, depicted in dead coloring, or uh, in Dutch, doodverf. We still have a saying in Dutch, a proverb in Dutch, uh, that, for instance, the gedood verf de winnaar, uh, the, the, um, the assumed winner, uh, the, pr the, predict the predictable winner. So the dood verf, the dead coloring, predicts the paint layers on top. Most of the modeling in lead white would take place in that layer, in the traditional 15th century work method in the Netherlands, in this dead coloring. On top of that, you have the paint layers, uh, either opaque or transparent, typically in oil, sometimes in mixed technique. Uh, tempera could also be used for some colors or for some, uh, some areas. And Netherlandish paintings would, uh, Netherlandish painters would already in the 15th and 16th century uh, use varnishes, typically based on oil and resins, 
to um, to protect, but also to uh, saturate the colors of their paintings. So that's the starting point. So we have this very difficult oeuvre, we have methods of looking at this oeuvre, and then you have a city in the Netherlands where Euronymous Bosch is born and where he passed away, who wants to make an exhibition. In preparation of this exhibition, Sertog and Bosch realized uh, we don't have any paintings by Bosch ourselves. Um, how can we um, have museums who own these works, how can we have them commit to uh, a project like this, an exhibition like this? So very early on in the project, people of the, the, uh, the mayor and Jos Koldewey, Professor Koldewey, realized that by organizing a major research project, that might be the best way to make this exhibition work. And what we did, and this is really, uh, it's just one of the bullets on the list, standardized non-invasive examination and documentation of almost the entire oeuvre. This is actually a really big thing. It's never been done before. There's not a single oeuvre that has been documented, even photographed in visible light uh, in a standardized fashion. So when, we, when you compare photos of the same painter in one book with another book or even in the same book, you never know what you're comparing. And when I explain to colleagues at the university that, this is, that we've done this for the first time, and they look at me and they kind of glaze over and they say, really? What have you been working with before? I say, well, we just work with what you have. So we, we did this, and not only in the visible light, we also did this in the infrared, uh, different wavelengths in the infrared, and in very high resolutions. Also, an important reason why the, um, uh, what helped the, pro the project succeed was the fact that we helped um, fund the restoration of five works through a nice grant from the Getty Foundation uh, in their panel paintings initiative. Uh, so th there were quite a few restorations, especially the works in Venice that needed structural work and that, um, that was fitted under that umbrella. In addition, five more works, not through the BRCP, not through the BRCP, but uh, five museums, <coughs> excuse me, who decided to lend to the exhibition, wanted to restore their own works uh, as well. And uh, among those works is actually a work in Vienna, uh, the beautiful carrying of the cross here in the Kunsthistorisches that Monica Strolz had uh, restored so beautifully. You see, of course, the after treatment image on the right. And when you notice when the, the degraded varnishes are removed, you, you how many, it's not just that it's less yellow and better visible and more beautiful colors. Now you actually have a much bigger sense of depth in an image and space and modeling. And Monica is here with us tonight. And I just want to congratulate you with this spectacular work. It's really very beautiful. Thank you. Back to the BRCP. Uh, what sets the BRCP apart as well is its interdisciplinary character. We have uh, the more traditional art historians, Matthijs Ilsink and Jos Koldewey, a technical art historian, but also an art conservator on the team, uh, and a, what really changed or really helped the overall quality, the professional art photographer on the team, who traveled with us uh, and his materials. Um, to all these works in situ. We also had Robert Erdman, uh, or have Robert Erdman on the team, who is not only a material scientist and a mathematician, but also an incredible um, computer wizard. That's the only right word to describe him. And it's really his work, Stefan, that uh, for all the viewers that he designed, uh, not, not mine. So he deserves all the credit there. And we had, of course, research, research assistants Hanneke Knapp and Daan Veldhuizen. So we ended up with terabytes, literally terabytes of information uh, in the visible, the infrared, and XRs. And the, um, all that material uh, had to be stitched. So what we do is we take high resolution images of postcard size areas of the painting. Yeah? And every postcard then has to be stitched back together. 
So you have a 400 megabyte postcard and you have hundreds of postcards from a single large painting. When that's all stitched back together, you end up with files that you cannot open in your own computer. So you need a, a digital infrastructure uh, that Rob Ertman designed for us in a wonderful way. It's the files are even too large for TIFF. They're too large for, uh, for Photoshop. Uh, if you have a chance, I would urge you to go online uh, at this address, uh, boschproject.org, where almost all the images are now available online. And you can zoom in and you can zoom out, you can combine images. It is truly remarkable. All right, but what I'm going to do now, rather than show you that eye candy, is take you on a trip through the layered structure of a painting and show you why some of these findings are so important for Bosch research. And we'll start with the panel support, which I mentioned was uh, in the Netherlands, almost invariably made out of Baltic oak. And here you see Peter Klein, uh, a dendrochronologist from Hamburg. What, what dendrochronology can do is it gives you, or it can help establish the earliest possible felling date for the tree that was used to produce the support panel. And of course, that's a terminus post quem for the painting. The painting cannot have been painted before the tree was felled. Makes sense. Um, why is that important? Well, here you have two paintings that have uh, traditionally been considered to be part of the larger group Bosch, uh, the crowning with thorns in the Escorial, and the wedding in Cana in Rotterdam, but the dendrochronological outcome determined that the earliest possible felling date for the wedding in Cana was no less than 1553, and the uh, crowning with thorns, 1525. You'll remember Bosch died in 1516. Uh, we need to reattribute re these works. Very clear cut. Uh, these are painted by followers of Hieronymus Bosch. But it's very often not so clear-cut, and especially by, with works that are late in the oeuvre, we have a problem. Dendrochronology runs into a problem of statistics. Here you see two versions of the same painting. There's two triptychs, and here you see them both closed. On the left, is the, uh, the Prado Heywain triptych, and on the right, uh, the Escorial triptych. You see the Escorial is slightly larger than the Prado version. The, we know that the earliest possible felling date, excuse me, of the Prado triptych, the Prado Heywain, is 1510. That's pushing it really quite far towards the death of, of Bosch. It's still possible. It's still possibly painted by Bosch, but it's getting late. But the surprise is that, and that's why it's important for us to consider, is that the Heywain in the Escorial, which is actually not painted by Bosch, but by a follower, um, the earliest possible felling date is 1498. So 12 years earlier than the Prado Heywain. But we know for certain, and I will show you that in about 10 minutes, that the Escorial version was painted after the Prado version. So always remember that even if the dendrochronological dating is early, painters could always have painted on older wood, of course. And we actually know from the archives that Bosch bought existing panels, existing wings from the, the uh, Church of St. John to paint on. So they used older wood. All right. Dendrochronology can do something else as well, which is really quite spectacular, and that is find links between supports of different works. And a wonderful example is the, uh, the Wayfarer in Rotterdam, which is now an octagonal shape, but that's not the original shape, and I'll tell you why. When Peter Klein uh, did the dendrochronology on this work, it's already almost 20 years ago, he found that the panel, that was uh, the, the tree that was used 
to make the Wayfarer panels had wood from the same tree as these three works. The Ship of Fools in Paris, The Ship of Fools in Paris, The Allegory of uh, Gluttony in New Haven, and The Death and the Miser in Washington. And you see them in scale here. So three others from the same, with wood from the same tree. All works were also incredibly thin. And in, uh, in, the, in around 2000, 2001, Friso Lammertse and Annetje Boersma of the Boymans Museum did a fantastic uh, discovery, or made a fantastic observation, really. And I'll, let, I'll show you. When we zoom in at the very center of the wayfarer, at the arrow, here you see the magnification. We're talking about this join right here. You'll see that the linear elements of the composition do not line up exactly. It's curious, because if they would be painted as a single panel, of course they would line up. And what they, uh, what they found is when you take it apart slightly, don't worry, this is only virtually, when you take it apart slightly, it actually does fit. And they saw those differences all through the panel. And they concluded, uh, really quite spectacularly, that the Wayfarer panel was originally not an octagonal panel, but it was originally also consisting of two wings, two panels, that formed the exterior of a triptych, just like the Escorial or the Prado version, the Prado version here on the right, eh, which have the same imagery. And they, they made a reconstruction of this, um, of this triptych with the wayfarer uh, on the exterior. Here you see the triptych closed, but when you open it, it actually looks like this. All these panels were incredibly thin, and what happened is that they were cut lengthwise, those wings. To, to sell the individual compositions uh, separately. And that uh, this is, um, for instance, the combination of Paris and New Haven on the left wing, that is indeed c is correct. You see this on this image, which is by far the worst photograph in my presentation. That's because I made it myself. Uh, I, I put my iPhone to the glass in the Den Bosch exhibition, and after the, uh, the Ship of Fools was cleaned, this is before cleaning, and after it was cleaned, you can actually see the tip of the fennel of this man, and also the glass that is resting here, the knee of this leg uh, com combined. There's, there can be no doubt that these two panels f originally formed a single panel, which was not only cut lengthwise, but also cut horizontally. The power of dendrochronology. Without Peter's finding, we probably would have never been able to make this case. We're going to move one step up from the panel to the, um, to the ground layer and the underdrawing. And especially the underdrawing is important for the study of Netherlandish paintings. IRR research, infrared reflectography, uh, that research can help us to study on the drawings and to trace the creative process yeah, and to, to try to find an artist, the artist's sources and the artist's intent. And I'll use the Death and the Miser from Washington that you just saw, yeah, the right wing, or the interior wing of that dismantled triptych, the Death and the Miser in Washington. Uh, we'll look for um, the original uh, intent of the artist. We're going to zoom in at this area. What, what you see, of course, is a man dying eh, on his deathbed. Death is entering through the door. He's pointing his arrow to the man. The man is being helped by an angel, supported by this angel, who is pointing to the crucifix in this window. There's also a man who is fingering money. Uh, it's not clear if he's putting money in there or taking it out, but he's also having a, a rosary in his other hand. There's some devils and, and little monsters. So we're going to zoom in the area with the arrow. And what we see 
is that the monster under the bed hanging holds this bag, presumably of filled with money, uh, and the, the dying man stretches his proper right arm out to it, and his other hand seems to be pointing towards death. But when we look at the underdrawing, we see something very different. We actually see that in his proper left hand, he holds a very expensive goblet. And he, even more interesting, he actually holds the, ma the, the bag in his hand. He is probably either giving it to the monster or taking it. That's a bit unclear. Moreover, if you look at the mouth of both the dying man and the monster, you'll see that in the underdrawing, the earlier design stage, both mouths are open, while in the paint surface, the mouths have closed. That means that in the initial design stage, there was more negotiation going on. Yeah, there was more negotiation between the man and the monster. He seems to be trying to buy more time. Um, and that's interesting in itself because we, you might ask, so what? Which is always a very important question. Yeah. So why is this important? Well, that's important because apparently the person who painted the paint surface, which we think was Bosch, uh, we think the underdrawing might have been done by an assistant, but we're not certain. But the person who, who painted the paint surface added ambiguity to the paint surface less clarity, it is less two-dimensional, the storyline. And Bosch does that very frequently. It's about choices in life. Yeah? Does the wayfarer go to the brothel on his left or does he move away from the brothel? It's always these choices. All right. The sources, the initial sources of the artist. Infrared can tell us about that as well. Here we see the Echo Homo at Frankfurt, at the Stedel, Stedel Kunst Institute. Um, and this, this scenery uh, request is presented to the people uh, is typically in the uh, in traditional uh, imagery is set against a closed uh, background. In this case, a, uh, a city wall and a gate and a big building. Uh, Bosch, on the other hand, chooses to paint a very l wide vista very beautiful painted vista uh, uh, on this uh, cityscape. So um, rather than this closed background, uh, Bosch opens it up. But lo and behold, when we look at the infrared of this detail, we actually see that initially here as well, a wall was prepared. We, we can actually, we are looking on the top of this wall and you can actually see how the arches were uh, planned there as well. So if I was to have a student who was doing a PhD about the uh, development of the Echo Homo as a, uh, as a composition, this is incredibly important material. That answers the so what question. Infrared research and the study of underdrawings can also aid in uh, issues of attribution uh, through stylistic analysis. Here you see the underdrawing of the wayfarer yeah, the, the, um, the, from the dismantled triptych, the Rotterdam octagonal panel. You see a very particular way of underdrawing. It's a very dense hatching, very, um, with cross hatchings, and, and it's a very uh, elaborate and with only very few changes from the earlier design to the later composition. The dagger was slightly longer in an earlier stage, but this is not really a creative moment. Th this composition is not really developed here. And the same thing we saw already in the Death and the Miser. And you, we shouldn't be surprised that the style of these underdrawings is very close, because they came from the same triptych. Yeah? So that's to be expected, that they are close. The same very dense webs of hatching and cross-hatching that prepare shadows and are often visible through the paint layers. But that's actually what's curious is that these underdrawings, 
that you see here stand alone in the group. There is no, there's no other underdrawings in Bosch paintings that are comparable except for the, the one in New Haven, and, uh, yeah, which you would expect, and the, the Ship of Fools. But besides that triptych, that is mental triptych, there are no other paintings that have that manner of underdrawing. What we see here, back to the Frankfurt painting, is a much more uh, typical way of underdrawing for Bosch, where he, with, a, with a larger brush and a very wettish medium, a watery medium, um, the areas of shade are prepared. And what's especially curious and also methodologically uh, complex for us is that when we zoom in, in another detail right here, is that we can clearly distinguish between different uh, steps in this underdrawing. When we, you can see broader lines, you can see medium broad lines, and you can see thinner lines. I hope you can see that. And those are actually, uh, we are convinced that these were drawn with different brushes, and some, in some cases also with a different medium. Yeah, so, and if they are indeed different stages in underdrawing, yeah, so he, he does, he finished one stage, stops for a second, picks up another brush. There's a, there's a distinct other stage that also means that somebody else, in principle, could have done that. that you could have had a division of labor not only in the paint stages, but also in the underdrawing stage. We can't exclude that. I'm not saying that that's the case. Yeah? We can't prove that, but it makes it much harder for us to actually use underdrawings in attribution issues. And um, in the Bosch group, uh, I don't think I've ever come a, an oeuvre that has been considered to be relatively uh, uniform, or not uniform in technique, but it, people, it's been together since the 16th century. I've, I've never come across an oeuvre where you saw so many variations in underdrawing as in the Bosch group. But that doesn't mean that we can't use uh, underdrawing to actually de-attribute works. I'll come to that in a second. And this is a good moment to bring back to you the fact that Bosch was born into a family, a dynasty of painters. Uh, his grandfather, uncles, uh, he had three uncles who were painters, who were of course trained by the grandfather together with uh, Euronymous' father, Antonis, and Father Antonis trained Euronymus and Goussen, Euronymus' older brother. So all these men were not only working together, they were also trained by the same person. So they must have been hard to separate those hands, almost by definition. Yeah? And we know that there were uh, assistants working in the shop, or different hands. We when we look at this very famous uh, sheet, the wood has ears, the field has eyes in Berlin, the, when you look at the reverse of the sheet, you, I think you don't have to be a great connoisseur to notice that there are tremendous differences in quality when you look at this beautifully drawn owl and tree and uh, like this, this doggy upside down or this face is slightly, uh, it, it's, it doesn't flow. Uh, this is not the same hand who is working on that. Uh, we also, uh, it's been assumed that the Latin uh, saying on top of the sheet that reads something in English, poor is the mind that always uses the inventions of others and invents nothing itself, is also an uh, admission to his students or his assistants to actually uh, come up with their own compositions and their own work. And we also, from the archives, there are a few mentions of assistants working with Bosch, but very, very few. So, works like this. Um, the Conjurer in Saint-Germain-en-Laye is, is, is a nice example of, you don't even have to look, I think, at the underdrawing to uh, consider the, the serious possibility that this is not a Bosch, eh? and we are certainly not the first to, uh, to suggest this, but this is 
it has very rigid contours, the paint layers are relatively opaque when you compare that to Bosch works, Boschian works, or core works. It is, um, it is stiff, it is not creative, there's no creative moment. And that you see in the underdrawing as well, which is contour only, there are no changes between the underdrawing and the paint surface. This is a copy after an existing uh, composition. And this original after which this was copied might well have been an original Bosch. And we, we know, of course, there's a print that mentions Bosch as inventor. But the, uh, we don't think that this, uh, this was certainly not painted by Bosch himself and probably also not in the workshop. But we're not certain there, and uh, I'll come to that in a second, because it's, it's much easier to distinguish between core group Bosch and what is beyond there. It is much harder to distinguish what the, air, what the borders are of the, uh, the workshop and where followers begin. Uh, that is a much bigger problem. Here you see the underdrawing of the uh, cutting of the stone or the cure of folly, which basically gives a similar situation. This, is not, this image was not developed here. This was not conceived here. This is not a creative moment when you compare that to other uh, works core, uh, from the core over by Bosch, which always show a creative process in the underdrawing. Underdrawings can also and quite easily distinguish between original and copy. And I promised you to explain why the Haywain in the Escorial was definitely painted after the Prado Haywain. And I'll show you that here. Here's the Prado Haywain. Uh, here's the Escorial Haywain opened. They really are very close in size and in composition. But we're going to zoom in at the lower left area of the central panel, first in the Prado Haywain. And you see here a man with a high hat. He has like a, a medieval baby Bjorn on his back with a, uh, a toddler or a, a baby. There's a child, another child here at his, uh, and you can see he has a staff. And already with the naked eye, I hope you can see that, is that, for instance, this staff was longer in the underdrawing than it was uh, painted. Yeah? The, if we look carefully, you can even see things shimmer through the paint layer here. And this is all much easier to see in the infrared, of course. And then we, we almost, it's harder to see the shorter painted staff than it is the underdrawn staff. And then we, we, when we look at the infrared and compare that with the paint surface, you see hundreds of smaller changes. Uh, they, this, is not, this, uh, this is certainly not a copy. This painting, this composition was conceived here. This is a creative process. The, the painter is searching for the right place of certain elements. This is the same area in the Escorial version, and you also will immediately see that the condition is not ideal. But uh, if we then also look at the infrared image of the, um, of the Escorial, you'll notice immediately is what you see is what you get. There is no creative moment there. This was copied after the Prado composition. So even though the dendrochronological dating puts it 12 years before the Prado, it was definitely painted after the Prado version. IRR can also do something very spectacular sometimes, and that's, that's really the bread and butter of this kind of research. It can reveal overpaintings, especially when the lower laying painted paint contains carbon when it's dark. Uh, and uh, typically, x-rays will pick up the lighter paint underneath, and I'll show you that in a second as well, but infrared will show the darker paint. Famous small panel in Madrid. It was cropped, a St. John uh, painting of paint, uh, pointing to his lamb, Eka Agnus Dei. Um, and next to St. John, you see this very strange, big, thistle-like plant. And there was, there's actually a large article written about the iconographical importance of this plant, which might have been uh, painted by Bosch to, uh, to show how the devil is trying to distract him from his meditations. Well, 
infrared showed something else. Infrared showed <laughs> that there was a donor, a patron painted initially next to St. John, who was then painted out. And we do not know why the donor was no longer welcome. Um, <laughs> but it's quite curious that within the oeuvre of Bosch, there are several paintings in which this has happened. And even in the, uh, the Last Judgment in, in Vienna, in the Academy, it's a slightly different situation because the donor there was underdrawn, then left in reserve from the background paint, but never painted. Yeah, so a very similar situation. All right, it's time to move on. Time to move to the later stages uh, of the painting and to actually look at some paint. Yeah? And I want to do that uh, on the hand of the famous Lisbon triptych, the triptych of St. Anthony. It's a spectacular triptych, which was not in the Bosch, but it was in the Madrid show, where it was absolute star of the show. And I want to start with two details on the right wing. And we'll begin with uh, the personification of lust. This standing newt, standing in a dead tree, uh, which has the shape of a vulva. And uh, when it's the personification of lust, that is actually not far-fetched, of course. And when we look at that dead tree in a little bit more detail, you can actually see that from that dead tree, there are saps dripping, there's resin dripping that sh she holds her, she's touching with her hand. And the, the colors of these saps are bright red and bright white. And the link, if that is lust, uh, the personification of lust and bodily fluids is really quite easily made. And the fact that Bosch painted that wet in wet, yeah, so with a while the wet, the lead white paint was fully wet, he took a, uh, a red glaze on a brush and he went straight through it that to, to even further emphasize the liquidity of the topic. So here, technique and iconography are like merging. It's really quite fascinating. There is a lot more to say about this image, for instance, that Gula, uh, the gluttony, the personification, was actually drinking. And the genitals of Gula are linked with the genitals of lust by this very transparent veil. I always use this uh, in class to warn my students that alcohol and sex do not mix very well. <laughs> it's anything to keep them awake. All right. Um, a last detail from this spectacular painting from this wing is the, uh, the battle on the bridge. Uh, in, the, in the background right. And when we zoom in here, you can see something of, of Bosch's incredible painting technique where he works a la prima. He doesn't use the dead coloring. Every touch, every brush stroke is spot on. It is, uh, this for me always feels very modern. It's almost like a Manet rather than a 16th century painter. I want to close this uh, presentation by showing you some of the absolutely remarkable changes that we uh, found. They were already found earlier, but not to the same extent as we uh, were able to establish uh, of the central panel of the, Boim of the, uh, uh, the Lisbon St. Anthony. So we're zooming in this area. And let me take a step back and let you give a second to get used to uh, what you're seeing. They're, they're really very much one-to-one -one in the same scale. So to make a long story short, the entire plateau on which the scene is set was not there in an original uh, composition. There was actually a river. The entire building here was also not there. There was a tent shape placed instead. I'll show you that in a second. It's clearer in the x-ray. So the, there was a complete other composition painted and we think almost fully finished, um, but then it was decided to, to uh, overpaint this or to paint this out and to change this composition completely. 
So here you see the X-ray of the same detail. Don't get distracted by these horizontal bars. They're at, they're at the back of the panel. Uh, but here you see this tent shape that I mentioned. But this tent, not only did the tower and Christ and the altar replace this structure, but you see there were all sorts of figures in that tent and very detailed with a uh, large beak. There's a table, people sitting around that table. I hope you can see that. So an incredible amount of change, bewildering amount of change that we were able to, um, to make a little bit more sense of. Here you see the infrared of the same detail which picked up on the interior of the tent, which was of course painted with more dark paint. But the real truly spectacular found, which is also very important for our future work on Bosch, we found in this area here below. And we see this fish, this boat fish, uh, which has a harness. There's two figures fishing. One uh, uses a spoon as, uh, either to row with or maybe as a rudder, uh, but there's a fish net. Um, in addition, we, we see the, uh, the vault of this stone plateau, which we know was later. But in an earlier stage, we see something very different. This is the x-ray of the same scene. And what you, what you see, I'll let me go back and forth a few times to, uh, to give you some bearing where we are. But what we see here is a figure, there's an arm with a fish. There's a bird here, a finch-like bird. But more peculiar, there is a figure here with a trumpet, do you see that? And his, his hand is, is... But there are no facial features of that figure blowing the trumpet. And he's actually blowing the trumpet out of his arse. And Bosch did that more often, that sort of, that sort of figures. But so we have a bird, we have a, uh, an arm with a fish, and we have a, a figure blowing a trumpet from his behind. Nothing of that is left in the surface, uh, which you see here again. When we look at the same uh, area in infrared, we see, the si when you know where to look now, uh, you see the same things. Here's the bird again, the finch, with the dark, finch-like bird with the dark head. Here's the arm and the fish. We only know that because of the x-ray, otherwise we would have never been able to determine that. But we also see something else. There's a figure here, it seems to be, leaning back like this. Yeah, there's an arm reaching for this strange uh, bow-like creature. And then here there's a half round uh, circle, which we didn't understand when we looked at it. Uh, initially, we thought it was the, the underdrawing of the vault, uh, which was shifted. But it was not the case, and I'll show you why. So here we have these images together, visible x-ray and infrared from Lisbon. And here you see a detail from a painting from Philadelphia. And suddenly, we understand that creature leaning back. There's a monkey sitting in the, in, in the back of the boat. The, fisher, the fishing figures are gone, and the, the, the figure with the spoon is gone. But we also have this area here that, that moves forward into the boat, and this half-round structure, which we didn't understand, is actually an, um, an sort of a cage structure in which the bird, which we now came to expect, is sitting. And did this bird actually has its claws. Let me go into a detail. This bird is actually sitting with his claws on the figure blowing a trumpet out of his arse. Astonishing. Why is this important? Well, this is really important because this is a really bad painting. <laughs> like a really bad painting. And it's always been uh, listed as a copy after Bosch. Uh, nobody's really looked at it. Uh, but the fact that this painter had access to and nobody else had, and no, there's over 15 copies, more even, of the central panel of the, of the Lisbon painting. But you know where you see those figures. That means that this very bad painter had access to that model. 
which must mean that it has uh, that it must have originated very close or perhaps even within the workshop of Hieronymus Bosch. And if that's the case, if the workshop had produced indeed not only A, B and C quality, but also D, E and F quality, we're going to have to look at this entire group again from a work and make our, uh, make our, how you call that, our net much bigger, much cast a much wider net uh, to see what else we can fit closer to Bosch. Of course, what I was able to present to you today was only the tip of the iceberg, literally. There's much more, uh, if, you, uh, if you want more, hard to imagine, but if you still want more, there's a lot to read up in our two-volume our two monograph, the Catholic Resonate on the left and the technical studies on the right. Uh, but I'll be happy to answer some questions if there are. But in the meantime, I want to thank you very much for your attention. It was a great privilege to speak here for you tonight. Thank you.